Hello everyone and welcome. This is Michael Conley, HP CareerNet Health Promotion Live and it's Friday again. And today I'm so happy to have uh, Dr. Tony Yancey. Let's see, Tony's going to talk about uh, organizational change. Oh, starting over. Organizational change is the sweet spot for getting societies to move and eat healthfully again because what is good for the waistline is good for the bottom line. Short activity oases may be woven into the fabric of work day, school day, or regularly remind us all of the fun and freedom signaled by the recess bell. Tony Antoinette K. Yancey, MD and PH, is currently professor at the in the Department of Health Sciences at UCLA Department of Public Health and the co-director of UCLA's Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Equity. Dr. Yancey's primary research interests are in chronic disease prevention with a focus on organizational practice and policy change and adolescent health promotion. She returned to academia full-time in 2001 after five years in public health policy, first as director of the public health of public health for the city of Richmond, Virginia. Ah, you were local almost and the Director of Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Dr. Yancey has authored more than 125 publications, including briefs, book chapters, health promotion videos, uh, and among these, 90 peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journal articles and editorials. She has generated $30 million in extramural funds, including four NIH independent investigator ROI R24 awards as, as principal investigator. She serves on the Institute for Medicine OIOM Standing Committee on Childhood Obesity Prevention National Physical Activity Plan Coordinating Committee from 2009 to 2007 to 2009 and during the CEO tran transition after retirement uh, of the board of founder. She chaired the board of directors in Oakland, California-based Public Health Institute. Tony, I'm so glad you're here. Great. Well, listen, thanks so much for having me, Michael, and I'm delighted to be with your audience today. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I've been describing as active by default policies and practices to get communities moving. And really, this is all about uh, addressing the uh, challenge that we're facing right now of sedentariness and um, uh, very high obesity rates. Um, pulling along the rates of diabetes and other chronic diseases that we, you know, thought we had a little bit of a handle on. Um, activity levels in this country are extremely low. So when we ask people how much activity they're getting, um, they tend to say um, uh, that they're getting six to. T they tend to say that they're um, uh, half of them tend to say that they're getting 30 minutes a day, five or more days a week, but when we actually measure it via accelerometer in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, we find out that um, the average adult is getting about eight minutes a day. And those that are meeting the recommendations, the federal recommendations, it's actually only about 5% um, or less of adults, about 10% of teens, and fewer than 50% than of elementary school children. So the problem is much larger, I think, than a lot of people realize. And um, part of the reason to stress that challenge, the magnitude of the problem, is that if, if we think that, you know, most people are kind of getting the amount that we think that they should get, then, you know, maybe some of the solutions like, you know, just building more walking trails will help. But if we recognize that people are getting actually very little physical activity, and also um, in the slide that I'm showing now that leisure time physical activities really haven't changed much over the last few decades. So this um, epidemic of obesity and sedentariness has really grown up in the face of, you know, no fewer people jogging. And, you know, in the case of kind of a little bit of a more recent uptick, I mean, about as many people jogging um, now as, as ever or going to the gym or whatever it is in their leisure time. So what's plummeted are rates of occupational uh, physical activity and other kinds of what we call utilitarian activity. So um, one of the big challenges is work. And um, uh, the amount of sedentary work has really increased a lot. Um, also, our entertainment has become much more sedentary, a lot more screen time. And most of us don't have to walk a lot for transportation. Um, 
there are relatively few cities, like I know you all are in the D.C. area, and so you have a pretty transit-rich city, but here in Los Angeles, that's certainly not the case, and it's not the case in most of America. So um, when we sit for long periods of time, it increases our risk of death. And, you know, there's a lot of um, debate in the community right now as to whether it's about the actual sitting itself or it's getting light activity. But the point is that when we're sitting, it shuts off the electro electrical activity in our legs. Um, it drops the rate of calorie burning. Um, it drops our fat burning enzymes. I mean, it drops the HDL or good kinds of cholesterol and makes our insulin less effective. So um, we're really literally killing ourselves, you know, with the kind of work that we're doing. So um, when I was the director of public health for um, when I was the director of public health for Richmond, Virginia, um, I actually sent out fitness instructors to um, community locations like churches and clinics and so forth to lead um, fitness breaks, but. When I got to L.A. County, um, there was no way that I could do that. I mean, uh, I went from a city of 200,000 to a county of 10 million, and uh, they weren't giving me adequate resources. I mean, I had about a dollar a head in Richmond to do chronic disease, but I didn't have $10 million when I got to L.A. County to do chronic disease. So I had to come up with a different strategy. And also through my research that I've done, you know, over the years, I've always been um, had a faculty appointment and done research along with um, working in public health practice. Um, I realized that, you know, you start a, a fitness class at a church or you, you know, get people uh, at a, a lunchtime walking club, and initially there's interest, but still, you know, at best you're talking about maybe 5%, 7% of the entire population of the workplace that's doing that, and that falls off considerably over time when it's a pull strategy. Um, in other words, when we're trying to motivate individuals to utilize their discretionary time for activity. Um, what, what I've kind of landed on is that we need more push strategies that make the active choice the default option. So in other words, people have to go out of their way or opt out um, of the active choice in order to be sedentary. And I think that promises uh, a broader level of engagement, especially for those at greater risk for obesity and sedentariness, including ethnic minority groups. So. Um, things like walking meetings, um, having exercise breaks at uh, certain times of day, on paid time, non-discretionary time, um, nearby parking restrictions to the disabled, um, or making the nearby parking much more expensive and the, the farther away parking cheaper, scheduling meetings at a distance from the workspace. And um, the, the practical reasons are that we spend a lot of time at work. And that's where um, we, a lot of us work many, many hours. Um, we commute long hours in many urban areas, in rural areas even. So um, we, we need those, opportunity, those opportunities outside of work are limited. And, and so we can capitalize on the fact that, in, fact, in, in, in essence, we have these captive audiences in the workplace. Um, the other point to make is that humans are really programmed evolutionarily for sedentariness. And, and most won't exercise on their own, even if given instructions, encouragement, and time. So when we, um, we hear a lot about people saying, well, you know, we just need to give them, um, give them some time on paid time for activity breaks. And I mean, that, that's better than, you know, they're having to do it on their own. But still, um, there was one study of data entry workers that showed that um, even when they were given some paid time to participate, um, it still was not even a majority of people that actually took advantage of that time. And we've seen that here in, in Culver City, California, small city within um, Los Angeles County, that makes 60 minutes available to their employees weekly for activity. You know, presumably that would be like 20 minutes three times a week, but only pretty much the, the active employees actually take advantage of that time. So when we have um, populations that have more challenges than average, like longer working hours, working multiple jobs, or longer commutes because um, it's more expensive to live in town, um, single parents, I mean, then there's really not a lot of discretionary time. Now, um, a part of what we've been doing is trying to build the case, and this is actually work from D. Eddington and his group at University of Michigan. Um, cross-sectionally looking at uh, employees of a large corporation and demonstrating that the moderately and very active employees on average um, had $250 less of paid health costs annually than the sedentary employees across all weight statuses, but that this um, effect was particularly prominent for the moderately and, and very uh, active obese employees. So um, basically what that's saying is that activity can actually um, offset some of the adverse 
the quality of the milder forms of obesity. Now, we're certainly not talking about um, morbid obesity here, but um, I think trying to get people who are moderately, uh, who, are, who are mildly obese or just overweight to um, think of themselves as being overweight and to, you know, get them focused on weight loss is really the wrong strategy. I mean, we all need more activity, even those of us that are athletes. Um, you mentioned that I, I played a little basketball in college and have continued to do that most of my adult life. But, um, you know, still, if I'm sitting for eight hours or even, you know, five or six hours, I mean, that that's not good for my health. So you can go and work out for an hour a day, and you still won't get up to that 10,000 step, you know, um, um, pedometer count that we would like to see people get to. So we need activity, and we need it spread out over the day. And um, sim a, a simple strategy like 10-minute activity breaks can um, lower waistlines and blood pressure. Um, can uh, serves as a relative appetite suppressant, so people may eat slightly more, but not as much more as the calories they burn. Contrary to you know all of the frou frou out there about you know well you can't you know you have to burn you know you have to run for two hours to burn off that burger. I mean you know it, um, energy balance is not a simple concept. It's not it's not as simple as calories in and calories out ways that we have of kind of revving up our engine a little bit and, and re-energizing ourselves are really very important. So um, I have a number of other uh, um, benefits identified, but um, let me just p point especially um, from the standpoint of the workplace and the school um, uh, routine to the improvements in cognitive processing, especially executive function. So. Um, Really, we're talking about um, employees being more um, uh, alert, um, more uh, productive during the time that they're spending in their chairs. You know, it's not only that um, there's a lot of absenteeism, but there's also a lot of presenteeism where people are in their chairs, but they're not doing very much. So we really need um, active activity breaks for that. And then just to underscore the point about the school day, that um, certainly the primary opportunity is physical education, but We've done some research to suggest that it's, um, if you just add minutes, you're not necessarily adding activity because a lot of kids are spending a lot of time just sitting around during those minutes. And in one study that we did here in, in the state of California, it was actually stratified by region of, of the state, um, th the average amount of activity that kids in the typical kind of lower income public schools were getting was like three to five minutes out of a 30-minute PE session. So we need these activity breaks, and we call them instant recess breaks. And I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of instant recess. But um, you know, there are a lot of other opportunities to get captive audiences moving as a regular part of the school day. Um, now, instant recess um, are breaks are specifically 10-minute activity breaks that are integrated into daily routine. So they're on paid time during the work day, during uh, non-PE classes during the school day. Um, they're uh, in religious worship services during the regular, like for instance, for a lot of Christian churches, a regular Sunday worship service. Um, and the point here is that we really need to increase the visibility of physical activity as something that is necessary for daily life and existence. Because unlike, um, unlike eating, we don't have a, a trigger, um, a powerful biological you know, signal like hunger to make us get up and move around. So um, we designed the scientifically to be simple and easily replicable, low impact, moderate, moderate intensity movements that are set to music, and really um, designed to produce a manageable level of, of exertion um, and positive and reinforcing, act, reinforcing act, affective responses and fitness improvements, but with a minimal injury risk. So in other words, um, when people perceive a lot of exertion, you know, when they're focused on how hard they're working, that tends to not be very reinforcing. So we're trying to, you know, give people something fun that kind of distracts them, you know, makes it more of a social occasion, and is really structured into the day to maximize the accessibility and effectiveness and minimize wasted time. So, you know, putting it right in the middle of the cubicles, you know, right where people can hear the music and, and see the action. And, you know, we want to tap into a little bit of peer pressure to get people moving. Um, we've implemented these in, you know, uh, over a thousand workplaces and um, 
literally thousands of schools since about 1999, and um, we have evaluated these breaks in both foundation and federally funded studies. Um, now, a, a couple of other points, and I kind of have made some of these already, but um, one that I didn't make is that um, the social piece is very important. I mean, we know that one of the, the, the number one correlates of, of engaging in physical activity in adulthood is the social interaction. Um, so getting people to be able to do something together, even though they're at very different levels of fitness, you know, you have you know, overweight or unfit people or disabled people who, you know, may not be able to do a regular kind of walking meeting, um, but they can all participate at some level. So we have people in wheelchairs that are moving their arms. I mean, you know, it's just really about people being able to vary the intensity and, um, and do something that, that's fun together that usually involves music and either ethnic dance or sports moves. Um, and we're really trying to drive participation with that desire for conformity. Um, we're also not interested in the stigmatization thing. I mean, I think there's already so much obligation in our lives. You know, people are feeling like we're, you know, always pulled in some direction. There's, there's always something going on that we have to do. And we don't want it to be like, you know, oh, another thing like brushing your teeth or whatever. We want this to be fun, play, stress release, um, and entitlement to move versus work, drudgery, or obligation. And we also need to, ca um, to counter the negative activity framing that's typical in food policy debates, like I mentioned earlier. You know, you've got to run five miles to run off that burger. Well, what's wrong with running five miles? And, and again, I don't even agree with that basic premise of it's as simple as energy in and energy out. So um, activity breaks, um, we just uh, published a, a systematic review of the literature in January in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, and you know, I've just kind of highlighted a few of those things. They were also kind of highlighted on the other slide. But I'll point particularly here to um, a couple of the things that I didn't mention on the other slide, which is the spillover effect, that um, people who engage in these activity breaks, these short bouts during the workday, tend to be more active during the non-work hours. And kids who engage in activity breaks during the school day tend to be more active during the hours outside of school, so both weekend and weekday time. So I think part of what's happening is that you know, eating is as simple as picking up a fork or biting into a piece of fruit. Activity is not as simple. And if people have not been doing it for a long time and are very deconditioned, then it's not very much fun. And it creates a lot of um, perceived exertion to do a small amount of movement. And there have been a couple of studies, I think a recent one by Eka Kakis looked at obese women um, and found that they were actually working at pretty close to their maximal um, cardiac output by walking at about a mile, and a, a mile and a half an hour pace. So I mean, that's like a snail's crawl to many of us who are more fit. But you know, again, it's not going to be very much fun for people who aren't fit to be, you know, doing some of the things that we routinely encourage them to do. Just take a walk for 30 minutes. I mean, that, that could be hard for somebody. So um, the other point is that there's a favorable return on investment. And um, the one company that I like to point to is the L.L. Bean plan in Maine. Um, they ha uh, did a study where they um, gave employees five-minute mandatory breaks on every shift. So each employee got a total of 15 minutes of physical activity. And they were able to determine, if based on hard outcomes, you know, how many bags and belts and shoes and whatever they produce come off the line, that they got 30 minutes of productivity. Um, so I know we started late. I'm going to try to move a little bit faster here. It seems like it is a little challenge advancing these slides. Um, so this, this uh, slide was from our feasibility study um, when we first started the, um, it was originally called Liftoff. And just to show that you, know, you can get people to participate, it is feasible. And, and people, um, and in our study at LA County, when I was uh, there in chronic disease, they were mostly overweight, middle-aged women, an ethnically diverse group. And um, one thing that we found was that there was a teachable moment. So people actually would come up to me later on and say, wow, I didn't realize I was in such bad shape. And often during these 10-minute breaks, people will say, oh my god, it's only been five minutes. You know, so I think that there is that opportunity to um, remind people, hey, you know, yeah, it's been a long time since you were involved in, uh, you know, your your high school um, 
uh, physical education class or you know the the dance club that you belong to. Um, this this slide is from some work that we did with FitWIC, and we're currently working with the California Fit um, California WIC agency now, training a lot of their their sites in uh, incorporating instant recess breaks. But um, I'll just point to that last bullet point, which shows that. Um, by virtue of adopting these activity breaks, they actually increased the counseling that they did with the WIC uh, clients or parents. So it was about twice as much. And in the, the um, uh, qualitative data that they suggested, uh, the qualitative data that we collected, they suggested that it was because they felt like they had an active tool to share with people. They weren't just pointing the finger. Now, this slide is from our working data, and it's, um, uh, looking at uh, a cross-sexual analysis of baseline uh, worksite policies and practices and their relationship to employee um, employees reporting um, group physical activity during work. So um, this study was actually uh, done in about um, uh, 25 sites with about 400 people, again, a very ethnically diverse group, primarily African-American women and Latinas um, who are on average obese and abdominally obese. And um, paid uh, physical activity on paid work time was associated with people doing more more physical activity. Now, that seems kind of a no-brainer, but, you know, often we have to prove the obvious, you know, scientifically to get people to pay attention. And these were the outcomes of that study. Oops, it looks like there's a little glitch in terms of um, uh, looks like there's some funny symbols there, but um, what we found is that there was uh, an effect size of minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury on blood pressure and an effect size of minus 0.4 kilograms per meter square um, on BMI. Now, the, 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 the effect on blood pressure was a slight decrease in the intervention group and a slight increase in the control group. In the, on the BMI, it was a stabilization of weight in the intervention group and a slight increase in the control group. And that is the secular trend for people to, to gain weight. Now, this is from a paper that's just out this month in uh, Preventing Chronic Disease, where we um, had uh, a, a, have a CDC grant to disseminate um, physical activity breaks and other um, sort of healthy by default strategies, like you know changing the food procurement policies and what's in the vending machines. And I'll just point to this last um, uh, line that in the primary sites that we worked with, so these were six organizations that we had, you know, often, some of them we'd been working with on and off for years, so that their baseline level of doing exercise breaks was pretty high for most organizations, and they still were able to increase it um, uh, by about 60%. Now, they then reached out to other organizations to try to get them to adopt these policies and practices, and the, the baseline level was much lower, so they got them up to about the same um, same level, about the same 55 percent, but that represented a 450 percent increase in that group. And this is um, some data that's just out from Kaiser. Um, that this was an implementation that they adopted on their own. Um, they have a wellness coordinator, um, Tiffany Creighton, who's a very uh, uh, avid um, um, uh, physical activity promotion person, and she's just been um, an amazing, what we call spark plug. And they launched Instant Recess in their call centers um, in uh, January and then April in their laboratory pathology unit and then in an inpatient unit in June. And in, in across these sites, they showed that um, for the, 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 the lab and the, I mean, not the lab, for the call center in the inpatient unit where absenteeism rates were high, they decreased uh, sick days by about two days compared to a similar period the prior year. And then um, looking at injuries in terms of accepted workers' comp claims, so this isn't just any in injury, but one that is actually deemed, um, uh, de deemed valid by their workers' comp office, it decreased in the call center from three to zero, and in the lab from 18 to 12, and then in the inpatient unit from one to zero, although that's just been going on for the past three months. And you can see the lab on the left there and the inpatient unit on the right. Um, and they've, they've really adapted this to fit. So they can't always do 10 minutes. Sometimes they can do three minutes or five minutes. But the point is that you know, they're making it happen, and they're making ha it happen on a regular daily basis. Um, now, this slide is from uh, some uh, pilot work that we did with a charter school in Phoenix. And they, um, they actually hosted, and it looks like the, the 
picture actually is covering some of the words, but they actually hosted a contest called um, uh, Got Moves, and um, they created a move that's kind of like the wave, so we incorporated that into the, the Padres Friar Fit Instant Recess Break that's actually done um, before every Sunday home game now. And we got some interesting comments from the teachers, and, and one particularly was that they felt that the kids, especially the girls, performed better in PE class because instant recess exercises built their confidence, and um, also that they found it was very feasible to use because it helped to settle the kids down like when, during transitions, like after lunch. So we, we also had um, a, 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 a rigorous evaluation of instant recess uh, through an active living research grant to um, Gramercy Research Group uh, with Dr. L Militia with Glover, and they they found not only did it increase the kids um, doing fitness activities during the the regular school day um, non PE time, but also that there were more kids who were on task. So this is something that also Matt Mahar has found with his Energizer studies. Um, you know that the kids, you know, obviously their concentration lags like all of ours does, and you know you can improve it by getting them involved in these brief activity breaks. And I won't go into detail on the next slide, but that's just basically what 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 it's showing is that um, in the control schools, the um, physical activity uh, levels. Um, uh, did not increase or fell off compared to the intervention groups. Um, my uh, doctoral, former doctoral student, now postdoc, uh, uh, Dr. Denise Woods, uh, did uh, as her dissertation research project, uh, also using an active living research grant, um, and a, a randomized controlled trial of um, about 650 students. Um, there were about 70 participating classrooms. and. Um, in the regression analysis, they found that on average it added about 1,900 steps a day to the school day for the kids in the, the um, intervention schools. Um, now, there have been a lot of other activity break studies. Uh, Pausa para tu salud is one in the Mexican Ministry of Health. Um, and uh, again, this is where some of the data has come from from those slides. That's the main foyer where they actually made them mandatory, and people, if they didn't want to do them with the group, they could do them at their seats, but then their employer had to do it with them. Um, I mentioned LL Bean already, and I'll just say that they, they actually um, view activity breaks as a safety measure, like wearing um, goggles or safety glasses. And now they've been even increased the amount of activity. They do a few minutes for every hour. So they're giving people even more than the 15 minutes a day. Um, Replacements, Replacements Limited is uh, a China um, distribution plant in Greensboro, North Carolina. Again, similarly, I've done some studies on this and determined that they have fewer musculoskeletal um, complaints um, when they actually incorporate the activity breaks into what they're doing. And they actually were able to decrease their workers' comp rating. Um, uh, this was Nico Pronk's work at Westinghouse in Texas. And you know again, significant improvements in mental health outcomes as well as physical health outcomes. And uh, the Danish Public Health Authority, this was a very recent, um, uh, recently published study. But statistically significant decreases in uh, systolic blood pressure, um, body fat percentage, and back pain, and increased muscle strength. Um, and they actually had two different intervention groups. One was where they um, actually did it in groups, and another they um, did a varying kind of group activity. So they had steppers in the, at the copier machines and eight-minute aerobic uh, uh, CDs and hallway punching bags. So both of those um, ways of, of approaching it worked. Um, and this is from the University of Kansas, uh, Joe Donnelly. This is one of the studies that I mentioned that showed a spillover effect um, of activity. So they improved in academic uh, performance, and uh, they um, uh, uh, averted weight gain, excess weight gain in the students. And they found that when the teachers were active with the students, student physical activity levels were higher. So um, schools are workplaces, too, and we really need to um, you know, engage them in that way. Ooh, it looks like there's a little bit of a problem with this, this slide, the, the photo. But um, we actually started the, the instant recess. It used to be called the lift off or lift those buns off the couches and chairs with uh, funding in part through the, the um, USDA food stamp program targeting low income families on healthy eating and incorporating physical activity. And then when we uh, 
engaged the Professional Athletes Council. Um, they also funded the first instant recess break with Alan Rossum. And, and these breaks are available for streaming. You'll see in the uh, one of the final slides online. This is also uh, online on YouTube. We worked with the WNBA Los Angeles Sparks. Um, they're uh, doing, um, they actually did uh, activity breaks during the actual game. So that's something that hasn't yet happened with the Padres. Um, they do it in the pregame show, but they've actually done it during the halftime and the uh, timeout. And they produced a CD and DVD, and we distributed lots of them and have used them in outreach to schools. That was the break that they mostly did at the schools that my doctoral student um, did the uh, project in. And then this is um, from the Padres, the, the pregame show um, instant recess breaks. Um, and the Petco Park, uh, the park in the park area, because you can kind of see in the bottom photo, the stadium is, is back there behind that jumbotron screen. But the other slide, uh, the other photo on top is looking out um, on all the, that Petco Park, uh, park in the park area, which is a joint use space with um, San Diego County Parks and Rec. Um, so we have a lot of other organizational profiles, and I know that um, you know, I want to move along because I know our time is, is uh, running by quickly. But um, one long-running uh, participant in Instant Recess was the city of Duarte. They've been doing three-minute physical activity breaks because their um, Parks and Rec director, Donna, Dor Donna Giorgino, um, uh, received training through the, the network for a healthy California, and she took it back and got one of the city council people who's a very strong proponent of fitness involved. So they do it every city council meeting, not at the end after everybody's left, but like actually the third thing on the agenda of the day. Um, and uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, I mentioned earlier, you know, um, uh, that there are obstacles to participating in longer bouts of activity, especially for women, not wanting to mess up hair or makeup. Um, this sorority turns up the air conditioning 15, <coughs> excuse me, 15 minutes before every instant recess break to make sure that everybody's uh, hairdos stay intact. And um, done a lot of training through the Orange County Health uh, care agency, and they've actually done better than the LA County Healthcare Agency that we originated this this uh, project in. But we intend to, you know, make up for that pretty soon. Um, this was uh, um, a Washington Post article that came out on the day that we launched the National Physical Activity Plan. So I actually am continuing to serve on the coordinating committee of the National Physical Activity Plan. Um, which is trying to implement the recommendations of the physical activity guidelines uh, that were released in October 2008. Um, to very little fanfare, because of course in October of 2008 we had an election that most of us were preoccupied with. Um, but anyway, they called it the calling card of the plan. And you know, I, I like that designation because it's basically saying, kind of like smoking bans were for tobacco control, that this is something that everybody can do. Everybody can get people together for these brief activity breaks and, and go about the business of doing the hard things that we need to do, like um, uh, having a more complete mass transit system and um, making sure that uh, parks are available for kids. Um, so this is a slide from the first time I met the First Lady. I'm on the Board of Directors of the Partnership for a Healthier America that supports the Let's Move campaign. And the First Lady's there in red, and I'm in blue. So I guess I must have been talking at the time, which is fortunate, because several of our board members were over to the far right of your slide. They got left out entirely, and that was the only photo they released from that. Um, Alliance for a Healthier Generation, and that was formed by the Clinton Foundation and the American Heart Association. They're now an independent nonprofit, and they have a healthy school framework program where they try to get schools to compete to um, be um, uh, listed as bronze, gold, silver, platinum in eight areas of focus. So they have a physical activity focus separate from PE, and 75% of those that they inventory, they work with about 12,000 schools, and they get about 3,500 to respond to their surveys. 75% um, said that they are giving kids daily opportunities to participate in physical activity breaks. And Jenny Ehrlich, the CEO, told me that that's because it's something that's feasible to do because, you know, with all of the cutbacks, the fact that there's so few PE teachers around and so forth, I mean, it's, it's become harder and harder. So um, instant recess is no substitute for PE. It's just another way of trying to get kids up to that 60 minutes a day, especially those in low-income communities that do not have 
um, you know, the park space or the parks are gang infested or they, you know, their parents um, don't feel that it's safe for them to be outside and, you know, they rather coop them up, you know. I've heard parents say, I'd rather have a dead kid than a, I'm a fat kid than a dead kid. And, you know, that, that's real for a lot of people. So there are a lot of different ways that they're doing this. They upload it, load it to uh, a school district server. They um, do it um, every morning at the top of the day. They run um, for a short period before they actually do the recess and get the principals and teachers and staff running with them. Um, definitely improves discipline in a lot of the anecdotal research as well as one study uh, that I've seen. And that's just a photo of those kids in St. Paul running before the recess break. Um, again, a little bit of a problem in terms of how these things, uh, the uh, logo is, is being shown here. But this is the Healthy Eating Active Living uh, Cities campaign. And that's the uh, website for it. 22 cities have adopted policies advocating activity breaks and meetings that last an hour or longer. And, um, we actually, at the last First Five Commission meeting, I actually um, uh, am a commissioner on the First Five Commission in Los Angeles County. Um, that's the monies from the tobacco tax, Proposition 10, to support, you know, getting kids a healthy start in life, so the zero to five population. So um, kind of spontaneously led an activity break at our uh, our last meeting in September. I just joined the, the uh, commission in February. And we now have a formal policy that we're going to be, um, uh, uh, that I'm putting in as a motion to adopt uh, for our next meeting coming up on October 19th um, to have physical activity breaks in every public commission meeting to encourage other county agencies to adopt those kinds of breaks and to encourage that among all of the grantees that the First Five Commission um, provides uh, funding to. Um, so the New York Times, uh, Jane Brody, who I'd met through a, a program that the California Endowment Funds for Minority Journalists, um, wrote about Instant Recess, my book that came out last fall, um, and, <coughs> excuse me, and definitely uh, helped the, the Amazon book ranking uh, for a few days. Um, this is one of my favorite reviews of, of my book because um, it's in life insurance selling, and one of the things that the guy says um, very early on is that, you know, this isn't the typical book that they discuss in the broker's bookcase, but um, he, he really got it. And, I mean, it's, it's not just about doing 10 minutes of activity breaks. It's really kind of, um, you know, my attempt was to write a food politics of physical activity. So it's, it's got a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, anecdotal kinds of stories about, you know, the serving on the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee and some of the things that have happened of, of late, you know, since joining the, the President's, uh, I mean, the um, First Lady's uh, um, Partnership for a Healthier America. But um, uh, it's, you know, NPR did a, did a, a story on the book, and, and um, uh, that was back in, in uh, April. And uh, it was really talking about just the, you know, the perils of, 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 of sitting. So I think this issue is really getting some traction. Now, the United Church of Christ, as a function of uh, their support of the Let's Move campaign, adopted Instant Recess. And they're doing um, this during the regular Sunday worship services. So this is a group in Spring, Texas, that's North Houston, doing musical pews. And this is the um, Mount Zion Congregational Church in the home um, city of the United Church of Christ, Cleveland, Ohio, doing the Jesus Shuffle during their regular Sunday service. And um, this was from the Washington Post. Um, uh, this was just uh, out September 6th, the day after Labor Day, called A Workout at Work. And we thought this was very funny. They did. Um, uh, instant recess moves, about eight of them are instant recess moves and the others um, come from other folks, but um, they actually ranked each move by how difficult it was, how sweaty they got, and how humiliating it was. So it was pretty funny. Um, the, the most humiliating move they said was the hallelujah, and that's the one that's most popular at the United Church of Christ and other faith-based communities, so pretty funny. Um, and then um, there, there are a couple of examples that we found where people have adopted instant recess, and we've never, you know, at least to our knowledge, had any direct contact with them. So this is Arizona State University's campus, and I have a, an assistant who's a, a Gen Xer. I'm a 
baby boomer, so I'm not so tech savvy, but my assistant uh, set a Google alert so I you know, can find out what's going on with Instant Recess. So this is them doing it outside their student center. And then something happened to the bottom of this slide, but um, uh, just on September 22nd, I saw a CBS News story about a Midlands, Texas um, school system that just adopted Instant Recess just you know, based on finding the, uh, uh, the break stream through YouTube. Um, now, this is uh, just just launching uh, on Wednesday is um, a toolkit, an instant recess toolkit that Keen um, produced. Keen is uh, a Portland-based outdoor footwear company, um, and they, they've just been an incredible partner. So the campaign is, is it, well, it began as a marketing campaign called Recess is Back, but they really view it now as a part of the company's fiber or DNA, and they've got 2020 goals for instigating a recess revolution. They actually just conducted a Harris poll and found that um, while 71% of the population, this was you know a U.S. population, although it's not you know purported to be absolutely representative, but 71% um, of the people said they never participated in. A, a, a recess break on paid time, but 53% said that if they were given those breaks, they would be healthier, happier, or more productive. Um, so this slide is the, the front. This is what you'll, you'll find when you go. So if you go to um, recess.keenfootwear.com um, or just you know, go to Keen's website, keenfootwear.com, and click on recess, you know, you'll, you'll be able to find it. But they're making, they, uh, as of uh, Wednesday, have been making this toolkit uh, available free of charge. And we also uh, work with several economists to create this uh, calculator tool so that you can put in how many employees you have, um, whether, uh, what kind of industry it is, uh, what the hourly wage is on average, and how many hours worked, and whether you intend to make the breaks mandatory or voluntary. And it will spit out a return on investment. And that, those numbers um, have run basically from $1.50 to $2 um, for every dollar invested in hosting a 10-minute activity break every day. Um, and the methodology, the entire you know, background for that with all of the literature is also available from Keen's site. They also produce two instant recess breaks of their own. So they have the business boot scoot where you got pouring the coffee and kicking the copier and all kinds of moves like that. And then you've also got a, a kind of a hiking one called King Says that's similar to Simon Says. And um, this is the um, all of the uh, different materials that are available on the toolkit. So there's the, the green is the CEO level. So it's the case for um, recess. Why, why would you know, somebody who's a decision maker within a company adopt this? There's the HR toolkit, which is for the you know the people who are actually doing this. You know, health promotion specialists, um, wellness coordinators, risk managers, um, and then there's uh, tools for the employees themselves. And again, all of this is available you know free of charge on their site. That's the bottom of it. And they also have posted a couple of um, instant recess breaks that we had produced before the African dance one and the one that the California Endowment. Um, uh, funded that is really the first time we've tried to create one to capture the culture of a particular uh, organization. So um, the uh, uh, this is up again. I hope you'll visit that site. You can also go to my website tonyancy.com and and see it. And then this is the um, the face page of the calculator itself. So it shows you know how you can enter you know the information about a particular company. It'll spit out the one year savings, and then you can actually go to download the Excel spreadsheet so you can see all of the cost categories and all of the um, uh, savings categories. And the savings categories are basically medical costs, presenteeism, absenteeism, and the um, distinct from presenteeism, which is a self-report measure, the, um, the uh, uh, objective performance increases that have been documented in places where it's easy to document that, like how many patients are seen or data entry or assembly lines. So, you know, I, I'd like to argue that recess break could be the smoking ban of the physical activity movement. Lord knows we need a movement now to, to really get us going and get some traction. And this is from a paper that I published. It's also in my book, uh, The Metabolition Model. Basically, we're trying to capitalize on 
the motivation that's already there in the leaders, they're already incentivized to achieve their organizational aims. And if we can align uh, activity breaks and other active by default strategies with those organizational objectives, like for instance, um, certainly the productivity thing, and that's what Keen has been so great at, you know, bringing to 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 the forefront. But also um, the um, schools, you know, so they need to get kids to perform better, they need to decrease absenteeism because that's a bottom line issue for them pocketbook wise, and they need better discipline and, you know, fewer unnecessary nursing visits, and that's been demonstrated in, in, in one study. Um, uh, for for uh, churches, for instance, you know, the ministers want people to be uh, awake still by the end of the sermon. They want them to contribute, put something into the collection plate. They want them to be alive, to volunteer and tithe for longer periods. So again, I mean, this is just kind of a way of, um, you know, I know there are a lot of arrows moving around, but it's just a way of trying to create a more dynamic uh, theory of population health behavior change um, versus the more static ones where you see all the levels and it's like, okay, well, how exactly, how exactly do we get into this thing? Where exactly do we, do we enter? Um, so um, instant recess materials are available. You can purchase them from my website, DVDs, CDs. You can stream them free of charge from my YouTube site or from the YouTube site that Gramercy Research runs. That's the group uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, with my good colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Militia Witt Glover. Uh, you can also register on the Gramercy Research site, and you can freely download um, these, these DVDs. And they're available in CD and DVD formats. Here are some of the um, uh, sample references for the, the data that I presented in these slides. And this is a slide of the folks that uh, um, are part of the, the recess team, the instant recess team um, from all over the country. A lot of professional athletes that you'll notice, like Dave Winfield, who was really cr critical in getting the Padres thing up and going. But you know, a lot of my colleagues. Um, Jim Salas, who heads the Active Living Research Program, Dr. Shariki Kumanyika, and um, 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 we're hoping that you know this will inspire you to get going. We find that the places that do the best in terms of long-term adoption are the ones that really make it their own. You know, they they create their own content and then they post it up and you know on our uh, Facebook fan page. So you know, I hope that you'll like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And uh, thank you for this time. Wonderful. Uh, I had to mute my microphone because I was kind of dancing around the room because I was feeling tremendous guilt for just sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> well, normally I embed a video into these, but, you know, I figured at this point in time with the, <laughs> the problems we were having getting on, it wasn't time for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully they can, they can go to the YouTube channel and see those. Um, uh, I think that, that that is so exciting to me that Keen is doing that. I mean, obviously there's something in it for them because people are going to buy their shoes. Mm -hmm. um, but wow, what a what a a smart thing for them to do. Uh, wouldn't it be awesome if more corporations saw the the benefit of supporting that kind of a initiative? Absolutely. And I mean, the private sector is critical to engage in this. I mean, that's really why I wrote the book, because, you know, I mean, it's like you can write plenty of journal articles, but, you know, how many of them are really getting the word out there? So, you know, I think that part of how King came to me was through, you know, the publicity that was, the PR for the book was more focused on the workplace. And, you know, that's, that's getting corporations engaged who, you know, you know, maybe even open to it, but just haven't been. I mean, I know I have a talk next week to give at Boeing, and, you know, these are places that I, you know, never would have been able to access. So I just think that the private sector is ready and poised and mobilized to, you know, get involved with government and academia on these things, and that's the only way we're really going to arrest this epidemic. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think you're right. The, the, the time is here, uh, and it's about darn time. <laughs> it um, is. <laughs> Kenneth has a question. He, he's wondering uh, participation in IR, uh, males versus females. Are, are, um, is one more likely to participate than others? Um, actually, that's a great question. And we really designed the instant recess um, program for uh, people who are less likely to be the ones to you know, go out and play sports or go to the gym and so forth. So I think that females, women, um, because 
that's the group that likes to dance and likes, you know, more likely to like to do things in groups. I think it is targeted to that group, and that group does tend to be more receptive to it. But I've actually not found too many people who don't like some break. Now, not everybody likes every break. I mean, some people like the dance ones, some people like the sports ones. And yes, I do find more often that the women like the dance ones and the men like the sports ones. But um, um, I, I really find that both you know, groups participate, and I would say that the, the least likely to participate are the, the high-ranking men in a particular um, organizational hierarchy. Um, more likely, white, um, affluent men are the ones who mostly are the scoff laws about this. But, you know, I mean, that's certainly not true across the board. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Sharon wants to know, do you plan to share this information with the commissioners of health um, uh, of the various departments of health, such as uh, New York City? Yeah, like, well, I mean, I'm happy to share it with whomever. Actually, New York City, somebody from wellness contacted me recently, and I sent them some information. But um, when I was on the uh, um, advisory committee to the director of the CDC, when Julie Gerberding was the director, um, Tom Frieden, who's now the CDC director, was on, on that ACD with me. And, you know, I talk to them all the time about instant recess. We did it at the ACD meetings at least some of the time. But, um, you know, I think everybody kind of comes to this when they come to it. And I think that um, there's so much more momentum behind the nutrition stuff. And the, the nutrition community in public health is so much larger and better organized and, and better mobilized. Um, it's been hard to get attention. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm really... Uh, honored to be serving, you know, on the Partnership for a Healthier America. I know that the First Lady gets it, and I think that um, because of her investment and the investment of others, you know, in in this partnership, um, the foundations like Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the California Endowment, Kaiser Permanente, Nemours, Kellogg, I mean, you know, this is, this is what it's going to take to really get, you know, this into the common parlance. Now, what I probably need to do is to try to get on the agenda for, you know, the, the um, uh, ASTO, NATO ASTO meeting, the Association of City and County Health Officers mm -hmm. and, and State and Territorial Health Officers. And since I used to be one, then maybe, maybe that'll work out. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds like a good way to approach it, but I think yeah, I think you're right. It's it's all about the uh, the teachable moment whenever that teachable moment arrives. Yeah. <laughs> Any other well, questions? Uh, I think that's it. Um, and we are a little over time, but you know we did have that uh, Murphy <laughs> rearing <laughs> yeah. his ugly head. Yeah, um, indeed. I really appreciate you being here. Um, you and I are going to have to talk offline uh, sometime soon because. Uh, you know, I, I am, you know, 500% into what you're talking about and, you know, want to contribute in any way I can. Hey, you can count on that. I will get my assistant to work with your assistant and we'll get a time on our calendars. Awesome. Have your people call my people. They can do lunch. There you go. <laughs> they can do lunch and we'll talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Take good All right, care and thank care. you so much for having me, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Right, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.